All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. We're excited to present seven ways to hack the mind of the online shopper. And today, especially, we're happy about having our guest CEO of Shopping Quizzes, Jenny Wong. So my name is Rob McGordy. I'm the Director of Operations and Product here at Webgility. I'm going to be your host. And we'll get into a little housekeeping here just to make sure everybody's clear. Uh, everybody set on mute, but we want to get your questions, so submit those through the chat box. Uh, we'll be monitoring those and try to follow up as soon as we can. If, for example, we can't get to a particular question, we will follow up after the webinar. Uh, everybody who's registered to the webinar will be getting a recording. And Jenny will also be sending out an ebook uh, via email to everybody who's here, which is awesome. On top of that, five lucky people uh, will win a hardcover of the ebook and will notify the winners via email after the webinar. So, uh, for all those that you are here, keep your fingers crossed. You might get that bookshelf souvenir. Uh, also, feel free to participate via Twitter. Uh, we're using the hashtag 7ways. That's the number 7, W-A-Y-S. Also, follow us on Twitter if you've not already done so by going to twitter.com slash webgility. And uh, Jenny, if you want to let everyone know where you are on Twitter. Absolutely. Uh, my Twitter handle is Dr. Jenny Wong. So that's at Dr. J E N N I E W O N G, Dr. Jenny Wong. Perfect. So, jumping into the agenda, today we have an hour. Um, and again, we're really looking forward to having a lively discussion. So, keep those questions coming uh, and we'll get them dropped into the presentation. After we cover some information about Webgility and shopping quizzes, we'll look at what's happening in our industry and why we think that this is really critical to focus on right now. Then we're going to take a look at the seven ways to hack the mind of the online shopper with practical applications that you can implement for your own business, ideally starting today. And if we have time, we'll cover some more in-depth applications such as the engaging emails and the content that need to go in there. And we'll close with some Q&A, but again, since we're trying to have this as a discussion, uh, I'll stop repeating myself, but definitely keep those questions coming in through the chat box. Um, we'd love to have the participation. And so now, uh, the presenters, I've already introduced myself. I'll let Jenny do a little of her own presenting as well. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny Wong, and it is a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I have been um, a social scientist uh, literally my entire adult life, starting off with uh, getting my PhD from the University of Southern California uh, when I was 22 years old. And so I really have a lifelong love of all of this research that I have condensed and am excited to share with you today. Um, I, so, you know, I started off life as an academic um, and then um, spent another decade after leaving graduate school as a management consultant where I picked up a lot of additional um, training and background in uh, essentially like, you know, brain-based persuasion and behavior change. Um, in, in that context, it was about trying to get employees to do what you wanted them to do in terms of behavior change, but I've um, taken a lot of that and applied it to my current incarnation as an entrepreneur and startup founder um, and helping retailers uh, get their shoppers to do what they want them to do. And it turns out that it all comes down to the same core set of principles. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. Excellent. And we'll get into a little bit more about shopping quizzes, but first, uh, just to let you know a little bit about Webgility. Um, we are the system that connects and unifies all the financial data across an e-commerce and in-person retail store, um, the entire business, in fact. So we lead the industry in the service, and we have thousands of happy companies to back uh, our shipping, inventory management, revenue, and uh, expense syncing. So our goal here is to be the multi-channel e-commerce uh, back end for finance and keep your operations running smoothly. We are compatible today with over 80 e-commerce platforms, including the big ones, Amazon, eBay, uh, and financial applications like QuickBooks and Xero. Overall, we help our customers process over 2.5 million orders each month, saving them an average of $7.6 million and 352,000 hours. So um, we're really excited to be hosting Jenny as, uh, again, the CEO of Shopping Quizzes. 
Cool. So let me tell you a little bit about shopping quizzes up front. And we will um, sort of take a look at shopping quizzes towards the uh, later on in the webinar because it really is uh, all seven ways in action. Um, and it's actually the reason that I decided to write the book, Seven Ways to Hack the Mind of the Online Shopper. Um, so what we create are interactive widgets. And we are a full service quiz provider for retailers and agencies. Uh, we also happen to be an award-winning startup, but what's most important is that we help our customers increase the engagement um, from their audiences, whether those are existing customers that you're emailing, where quizzes um, improve email open rates, or whether it is giving you a really engaging piece of content to use for like your Facebook ads, because everybody knows quizzes are the most viral content on Facebook. Um, and then when you put quizzes on your site, when they get to a shopping quiz, they increase the conversion rate. Uh, so if you're, you know, looking for a lift from, you know, 1% to 1.2%, you know that that actually contributes huge value to your bottom line. Um, and so given that that's what shopping quizzes do, uh, despite the fact that the um, interface is incredibly simple to use, I was getting the question a lot. You know, why does this work, right? It's so, it's a five second experience for the shopper, and yet it seems like there are some Jedi mind tricks that are going on in that five seconds inside those uh, three or four clicks. You know, why is this working? And I realized I was sort of like verbally giving this whole dissertation about all of the principles and all of the research. And I thought, you know, I should, I should write this down. And what I initially thought was going to be uh, maybe like a really long blog post turned out to be a really short book. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jenny. And obviously there's a huge need in the market for this today. Um, so we're excited to take a look at the research that underpins this product. Um, so I'll hand over control to you. You can advance the slides, and we're excited to jump in. Okay, great. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at the core cognitive principles that are coming out of over 30 years of academic research. And um, this you know, these learnings and insights and, 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 and evidence-based findings are coming out of places like Stanford and Princeton and Florida State and Duke and all these wonderful places. But before we get into that, I think one of the most important questions you have to answer is why. Why now? Why is this a critical, you know, a critical thing for you to understand in the year 2016? And, you know, and the, and the bottom line is it's because not only is e-commerce eating the economy, but mobile is eating e-commerce. And so we find ourselves faced with this idea of, you know, what is the actual device of shopping? And it turns out the actual hardware that people use to shop is not that piece of electronics that they're holding in their hand or carrying around with them in a backpack. The actual thing that they're shopping with, the actual piece of hardware is between their ears. It is the human brain. That's the decision engine that determines whether a purchase is made or purchase is abandoned. So right now, as we are seeing tremendous disruption in the physical hardware, I think now is the perfect time and the most crucial time for all people who sell online to, you know, take a big leap forward in their understanding of the mental hardware. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different concepts today, and you're going to walk away uh, with insight and learning that you're going to be able to apply um, you know, and start thinking about how that is going to improve your online customer journey immediately. But that said, you know, of these seven principles, not every single one is necessarily going to be appropriate to your particular situation. Every seller, every site, every product, and most importantly, every shopper is different. So it might be that if you sell in a certain niche to a certain customer profile, some of these may not be effective or may not be appropriate for you. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, the caveat that I want to put out there really up front. But what we want to focus on is the things that you can take away. So these cognitive principles should suggest to you certain specific hypotheses about your business. So when you, as you think about what you sell and how you sell it, um, these, you know, finally having a name for some of your gut feelings should be really helpful as to why something you've been doing is working really well, and maybe it's finally an explanation for why that thing you tried last year kind of flopped and you don't really know why, 
maybe you'll walk away in the next 50 minutes with a specific name for that and even some citations as <laughs> to explaining that. And so um, for whatever ideas you get, what you want to do is make sure to rigorously test them for your own situation to ensure that they are appropriate before like you go whole hog and do like a whole site redesign based on like principle four or something like that. Okay, so moving on. So here they are. These are the seven ways. This is the, this is the whole enchilada right here. This is what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about paradox of choice, processing fluency, just-in-time information, micro-commitments, simultaneous choice presentation, the compromise effect, and reactance theory. So I know that that's all kind of a mouthful, and maybe a couple of those really ring a bell for you, and maybe some of those you're really uh, reading for the first time. Um, one of the things that we'll cover as we go through is each of these goes by uh, a whole bunch of different names, and so it's very likely you'll find that they, these are more familiar concepts once we get into all their synonyms. And then here is the really high-level summary, right? Uh, you know, in a nutshell, the human brain likes fewer, better choices. The human brain likes easy-to-process visuals. The human brain likes to have its freedom to choose, its free will affirmed, and the human brain also really likes happy mediums. Of course, the opposing list is everything the opposite. It, right? The corollary to all of that is one of the things the human brain really hates the most is being overwhelmed with options and information. We also don't generally love reading, processing, and being forced to remember lots of text. If you think about what a legal document looks, you know, you think about a legal document in like 10 point font, <laughs> it's all single space, and what that feels like emotionally, we don't like that. Our brains don't like that. We also don't like being told what to do, and we don't like extremes. So if you are going to come back to a single slide out of this entire deck, this is the slide to come back to, to kind of refresh later. So with all of that preamble done, let's go ahead and dive into the very first principle, which is the paradox of choice. So this is the first way that you can hack the mind of the online shopper, is by understanding and solving the paradox of choice or at least not making it worse in your online store. Um, so the paradox of choice says that the more choices we have, the less likely we are to buy anything at all. And this is obviously um, a key principle for people who sell online because not only do you have competitors that maybe sell something similar to what you offer, um, but actually your number Number one competition is not the other store. Your number one competition is inertia and no decision at all. Simply abandoning the visit, abandoning the cart, and just saying, you know, the, the, um, the shopper thinks to themselves, not like, oh, I don't want this anymore, I'm never going to buy this, but instead they think to themselves, I'll do this later. Like, this is starting to feel lengthy or hard, so I'm going to click away. Unfortunately, for the retailer, uh, you know, they've already paid for that click. Uh, and it's just as good as losing a sale. Now, the paradox of choice has um, other names. So, you know, we oftentimes talk about it conversationally as analysis paralysis. There was also an extremely popular article in the New York Times uh, that, that popularized the, this name for it of decision fatigue. It said, do you have this decision fatigue? Um, ego depletion is another one of the researcher terms that's used for this. And then there was also, um, a, there's a Nobel Prize winning um, theoretician out of Princeton who refers to this as system one and system two thinking. So Daniel Kahneman has a best-selling book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And this actually all taps into the paradox of choice. So those are some of the other names that it goes by. It's aliases. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, you know, people really um, you know, identify with when they think about the paradox of choice is they may have seen the TED Talk uh, by Dr. Barry Schwartz, and he is the author of the book, The Paradox of Choice. So millions of people have seen that talk, TED Talk. You may have heard of it as well. But um, when it comes back to the uh, sort of the key study, the seminal work on the paradox of choice, it's actually the JAM study. 
So the JAM study, which you can see the graphic here, uh, was conducted uh, with uh, uh, prof one of the professors was from Stanford, and so this was a Bay Area grocery store, a physical grocery store, where the researchers went in and they set up a table uh, in the grocery store and they put out six gourmet jams. And shoppers in the store could walk up to the table, they could taste the jam, they could buy the jam. And about 30% of shoppers bought some jam. Uh, apparently it was pretty good jam. <laughs> um, the interesting part of the study was when they came back a few weeks later. And this time, it was the same grocery store, it was the same table, it was the same researchers, but this time they had 24 varieties of jam. Same deal, shoppers, and the physical store could walk up to it, taste it, buy some, but you know what? They sold 90% less, less jam. Only 3% of shoppers who walked up to the table walked away with a purchase in their hand. Um, and this, you know, should really, this should really strike a chord because e-commerce is all about the extensive choice condition. So what can you do about it? So if you take this learning away, what you realize is that you need to try to avoid in your site design triggering the paradox of choice. You want to minimize the sensation of decision fatigue. Like I just can't look at another pair of black flats. Like my brain is tired, I'm going to go do something else, I'm going to click away. Um, and so this is one of the first applications that you can use for the paradox of choice is think about do you, you know, should you really be showing long scrolling pages of thumbnail images? Um, because, you know, as somebody starts scrolling, I think we've probably all seen this um, in people interacting um, with different sites, is that as they start scrolling, they just start scrolling faster and faster, but they're not getting any further down the actual decision funnel, which is where you want that. Instead, what you want to do is actually give them uh, an option that starts to feel like they're drilling down, because drilling down is usually what leads to the purchase. So you want to show popular options for a segment and maybe give them an option to see more within a particular segment, because this actually is uh, signaling to themselves that they are interested in this particular segment and now they're going to start to focus with a little more specificity, and that's all good for conversions. Another thing that I see retailers doing, um, and which happens to be a pet peeve of mine personally, is that they'll show multiple thumbnail images of the same item. And this is extremely confusing for shoppers in general, for me as a shopper personally, because I'm not clear if there's a difference between these two things. Like, is it just a different color, or is there some subtle difference that I'm missing in this shirt versus that shirt? Like, now I have to go and read the product description and try and figure it out. And that's all spending cognitive budget. Instead, if you do it this way, I'm more clear uh, as to what I'm looking at and I perceive less of a sense of overwhelm and fatigue. Another example of applying this principle to e-commerce is the best practice of deep linking. So um, I see retailers doing this, uh, even, even you know, some of the largest uh, retailers, like this is actually an example from, uh, I believe, Gap, where here they're touting the new wireless bras, right? And um, that's something I'm interested in, so I'm going to click that call to action button. But instead of taking me to a filtered page or a segmented page for wireless bras, it actually takes me to the top level page for all bras. So once again, I feel overwhelmed and, oh, now I have to mentally filter, which is a form of work, uh, for the ones that I thought I was getting, um, you know, drilled down to. And instead of being deeper in the funnel like I expected, I'm way up at the top and further from completing a purchase. So what you want to do is this, right? Especially if you're creating the expectation of a targeted link, make sure you do utilize that deep link. So in a nutshell, what you're really trying to do here is make sure that even as you're offering all the choices that you do need to offer to play in the space of e-commerce, that you're still cognizant of the fact that the caveman brain gets very easily overwhelmed. Yeah, this is really great stuff. Uh, I know especially here at Webgility, we're hyper aware of all the options and features that we try to give to our customers. And 
are constantly trying to find new ways to express that in an easy to digest way. And same thing from a different perspective, a lot of our customers have tens of thousands of individual SKUs and kits and bundles and uh, this is really great content to make sure that they are providing that to the customer in an easy way to digest. But I do have a question Absolutely. Uh, that's sort of mm -hmm. on the other side. How is this related to or different than the experience of say like an Ikea or a department store where it seems like most of their strategy is to get you to see as many things as they possibly can before you get to either the thing you want or get back out. All right, like Ikea makes mm -hmm. you walk around the entire department store. Um, last time I tried to return something at Macy's, I had to go through four different uh, departments just so I'd have to see things, right? Is right, that <laughs> yes. Well, um, so, so this principle absolutely applies to brick and mortar. Right. So number one, um, you know, I'm, I, I mean, I, you know, I've, I haven't like researched them in the last month or so, but my uh, impression is that Macy's isn't necessarily doing that well. Um, and, uh, and you also have to think in the IKEA example, you have to ask yourself, you know, if IKEA wasn't the price leader, how many of us would go there? Right. Um, I know a lot of people who find IKEA to be overwhelming. But the price model is so strong, the value proposition um, compared to, you know, um, other competitors, their branding is really strong. Um, you know, I think all of that is where their strength is. And their strength is not that, you know, people think, oh, I'll just pop into Ikea. This will be really fast and easy. Um, and you also think about um, how, how habitually, I mean, we are habituated maybe to going to Ikea, but I think for a lot of online sellers, they don't want shoppers to come once or twice a year. They want them to come and be servicing their needs and looking around on a weekly, monthly, you know, every two or three months. Like, they want to come back to the site. And I don't want to go to Ikea every week. It's, it's, it's very overwhelming. All right. That makes a lot of sense. So let's uh, continue on. We want to make sure that we're getting through all this great content. Okay, cool. So the next um, the next cognitive principle is processing fluency. So what is processing fluency? Um, when information is faster and easier to process, we like it better and are also, and this is the key thing for online sellers, we're more likely to take action. So when you can make the information you're presenting on your site uh, easy to process and, and quick to process, you're, you are more likely to convert to a purchase. So uh, once again, conversationally, we might talk about this as brain cycles. Uh, in the research is sometimes referred to as conceptual fluency or processing speed. Um, and then advertisers might be familiar with it as rhyme as reason bias. So we're going to see a little bit of all of that. So um, this is one of the uh, most important studies that was done in the area of processing fluency. And what you can see here is two identical sets of product information. Um, the, the subjects in the study were asked to make a decision between two different cordless phones. And yes, this, this was done back in the era of cordless phones. Um, the only difference in the experimental condition versus the control condition was that some of the um, subjects were given the information about the phones in a hard to read font. And you can see the one on the left is kind of blurry. It looks kind of smudged. It's hard to read. And then the one on the right is intended to be the representation of the much, you know, more clear font. And the key thing is, is that you had way more people elect to pick neither. And so this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, right? Your competition is not always the other guy or the other seller, but rather no choice at all. So even just this slight blurring of the font increased the level of deferral by a huge percentage. 41% defer the choice versus 17% deferring the choice, which means 83% were able to make the decision when the processing of the product data was fluent. So we see this in a lot of um, high design sites. I always like to say, don't let your designer talk you into a gray font. <laughs> you want to be really careful with anything that impacts um, legibility, even if it looks really good. You want to think about processing fluency. Another way that this concept shows up is not just in the selection of fonts or the size of the font, but also 
um, anything that impacts uh, your shopper's ability to understand. So if you use technical jargon like, you know, uh, paraffinitic, hydro traded, you know, I'm like, I, I like, I know a good bit about cars, <laughs> but I'm not sure I, I know whether or not I need a viscosity improver for my motor oil. And so when you use um, terms that your shopper, that your average shopper can't really define, um, you are decreasing their processing fluency and their ability to make the decision you want them to make, which is to enter their credit card. Um, and this is something that I feel like uh, retailers uh, have sometimes as a blind spot because they are experts, right? As, as an online seller, you know, that sells a certain category of product, sometimes we forget that that makes you an expert. And so the vocabulary that seems really straightforward to you may not always be straightforward to others. We were working with a shopping quizzes customer that had a really amazing selection of rugs. And they thought that, you know, the, the way that they categorized all of these beautiful rugs, it made perfect sense to them. But me, as an average buyer of rugs, I don't know, I don't understand the difference between a Regency rug versus a Bohemian rug, you know, and, and, and it's difficult to determine. So that's the type of thing that you want to go back. Like this afternoon, like when you leave this webinar, go back and look at your site and ask yourself, could an eighth grader understand everything you're talking about? Is there any jargon there? So that decreases fluency, right? Jargon decreases fluency. These are the things that increase fluency. So alliteration and rhyming increase fluency. Um, and, 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 you know, it's almost, it's very disproportionate, right? Like you would think if it just because, you know, wet and wild is alliterative or Krispy Kreme or Molly Maid, uh, just because these things are alliterative, you would tend to think like, well, that, you know, like that's cute, but it shouldn't matter that much, right? Well, surprisingly, it really does. Having these kinds of rhyming and alliterative names uh, and slogans really helps your offering, your value proposition, um, your product stick in the consumer's mind. Your company may already have a name, and so you may not, um, you know, want to rock the boat there. But if you're looking for a tagline, um, if you're introducing a new product, if you're white labeling something, you know, think about you know, go, go that extra mile, you know, like brainstorm the extra 30 minutes <laughs> and see if you can make rhyming or alliterative uh, fluency your friend, make it work for you the way it works for these companies. And then um, the third application here for fluency has to do with basic loading speed, right? Speed sells. Uh, I see that, this alliterative, see what I did there? Speed sells. So that make it, makes it easy for you to remember. Um, you know, you want to be cognizant um, not only of, um, you know, the, the infrastructure on your side, but also think about um, those users that are actually our product fast and easy to process. Your shopper won't even know why they like it better, but they will. That's great stuff. We and a... We've had some pretty good uh, comments coming in from the attendees, one of which I thought was really smart. Uh, do you know if there's any fonts that are universally uh, like benchmarks or good for e-commerce? Are there any particular fonts that you start out there and you can't go wrong? You know, that's a really good question, and I will have to look into that one because I don't want to, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of super boring when it comes to the fonts that I use. You know, I have, like, the standard serif font, and then, you know, I'm using, like, Arial and Helvetica. Uh, but I think that, you know, our designer might have some thoughts on that, and I'd love to research that and come back uh, and send that out with, um, you know, a little bit of more evidence behind it because my taste in fonts is not my strength. <laughs> <laughs> but that's awesome. a really good. But that's a really good question. I want to know the answer to that too. Yep. And is there is there any fault here in sort of simplifying some of the things that we're talking about and trying to remember it with the keep it simple, stupid, the kiss acronym? Um, I'm sorry. Can you say that again? I did. I didn't quite catch that. What's the question? Sure. So the the keep it simple, stupid, the K I S S acronym. 
are would that be beneficial to keep that in mind as we go through this? Is that sort of an overarching thought, or do you think there's any pitfalls going that route? You know, I think there are a few pitfalls um, in 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 reducing all of this to the notion of simplicity, right? Because uh, you know, you can actually oversimplify something, um, and uh, and actually, you know, I. I'm gonna I'm gonna break order a little bit here because that's such a good question. I'm gonna talk just a little bit right now about the, the not the next one but the one after, <laughs> which is micro commitment. Okay, so um, and I'll I'll talk about it in depth when we get there, but I want to talk about it a little bit right now. So um, simplicity, different people will think about that in different ways, right? It's not necessarily about making things really stark or Fair or minimalist or few words, that's not necessarily the key, although those are some of the synonyms for simplicity. I think slippery is more important than simple, simple, if that makes sense. Excellent. And uh, we're going to go into a poll in just a second, but we have one last question that came in. It would be interesting to, to get your takes on. Are there any differences uh, as you go through different countries and the quiz, quiz participants there? Like would somebody who speaks French or German or English have a different perspective on their quizzes? You know, I think there are different, there are cultural differences in what people expect to see on a website um, and that and that is really important to take into account um, so um, for example like what I noticed is that Chinese I'm Chinese um, I can't read or write Chinese but I, I speak Chinese um, and I am Chinese and so when 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 I look at those Chinese sites you know as someone who grew up in the United States they they look incredibly busy to my sort of a American cultural eye, right? It's like, wow, there's a lot going on there, and that's very jarring to somebody who's used to the cleaner designs of American sites, um, and a lot of, like, just say, westernized sites in general, right? Not just U.S. Um, and so there is that sort of difference in expectation. Um, however, what we're we're talking about here in terms of the cognitive principles actually have to do with like the layers of the brain. Like so, for example, the fact that the visual cortex is older than the neocortex where language resides, that's universal, right? Like you could be, um, you know, uh, uh, speaking Chinese, or you could be speaking Italian, or you could be speaking, you know. Um, like a, a, a Spanish, it doesn't matter. Uh, that fact is the same for all of humanity. So that, so that's sort of the 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 yes but answer to that question. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, uh, I misspoke. We actually don't have a poll up next, so we got one more section to go through before we need to ask the audience any questions. Okay, here we go. So just in time information. Um, just in time information. Uh, is kind of an adult learning principle, right? Which is that people don't absorb information until they need the information. <laughs> and this is something that we experience, right? Like if I try to tell my husband that two weeks from now, the birthday party is, you know, at such and such a place, his odds of remembering that information or finding it to be relevant to him are incredibly low. However, when the party's an hour away, he's going to be like, oh, now I really need to know where I'm driving this child. <laughs> and so uh, this, is, this is sort of a, 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 a you know, intuitive thing that actually has a formal name. Uh, we call it just-in-time information, but it also um, comes out of research that's done in departments of education uh, where it's called flipped classroom and interactive engagement. Um, it, it even has like a specific... Um, you know, audience within, um, you know, user experience and, um, you know, interaction design. And you and I probably know this is that, you know, people, a lot of people don't read on the web, right? They're, they're, they're not interested in consuming a lot of text. And here's where we see the, the you know, dominance of like visual form 
you know, whether it's a video or an infographic or, you know, the preference for photos over reading is incredibly strong. Partly it's just because, you know, text represents information that we don't need right that second. So it's sometimes not as appealing. Um, so, um, oh yeah, and then the last thing is one of the reasons that we incorporate research uh, in this principle from, uh, you know, classroom settings is because for a lot of sellers, um, education is a key component of closing the sale. So that's why this information is relevant to e-commerce and, um, and, 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 you know, these, these audiences. So here's uh, the key study which is sort of the difference between traditional teaching versus interactive engagement or uh, just-in-time information slash flipped classroom. So uh, this was a uh, study done with physics students, so with high school and college physics students, and you know, a portion of them were given traditional teaching. Um, and that traditional teaching is basically lecture. Um, and this is kind of like when somebody shows up at your site and you have, you know, two, three paragraphs that you want them to read. That feels a lot like traditional lecture. The opposite condition was interactive engagement. So this is where there was feedback and questions and interaction and there was sort of like that loop. And what they saw at the end of the semester was that there was a huge difference in the amount of learning that happened. Now for the e-commerce situation, or for a lot of your sellers, Learning the value proposition is, uh, you know, obviously going to have a really positive influence on the rate of selling. <clears throat> so here's what you can do to apply this concept of just-in-time information. So number one is to use visuals to reinforce definitions, right? So, um, so this, this is like a not a complicated category, right? This is window coverage, right? I don't think anybody considers drapes to be high tech. Uh, and yet, you know, could you say off the top of your head, what's the difference between a blind versus a shade, right? Well, here they reinforce that in a way that once again appeals to that old part of the brain, the primal caveman brain, which is the visual cortex, versus having you read a blog post about the difference between blinds and shades. And so um, you want to make sure that uh, you, you are not making this necessary because it decreases your odds of converting. Um, so that's just in category navigation. Another thing that you can do to apply just-in-time information is to provide detailed information after the shopper is curious. So as you can see here, I'm looking at a specific gown jacket that I'm interested in. Now I want to understand how these comfort ratings happen, right? Don't tell me, don't try to tell me about that up front. Um, and, and where we see this done right, a lot of times is in um, ch uh, checkout and payment, right? Is that they'll put the purchasing help information right next to where it's needed, right next to where the action has to take place. Um, and so uh, the other sort of application of this would be live chat. If you have the ability to put interaction um, on your site, a lot of retailers are seeing that this boosts conversions and, interestingly enough, average order value. So if you can do that, it's great to do. So yeah, just make sure that you think about when your shopper needs the information and don't give it to them too soon because it'll kind of bounce off. Excellent. So just to see if we can solidify some of this, we're going to jump into a poll. And the poll asks, as you can see, which of the first three principles do you feel is the greatest opportunity for your business? We've got a lot coming in early at the paradox of choice, but the other two are making some progress here. Oh, interesting. Now, quick question um, while everyone's responding here. Do you have any any thoughts on background colors for photos? Uh, should they all be white? Is it okay to have a lifestyle photo? Um, is there any research to back either one of those? Um, I think what is um, important about photography is processing speed. So um, a lot of times you will see really beautiful photos, but they're extremely detailed. And so I think at this point you can guess what that means for processing speed right, is that that's something where, like, if somebody has to lean forward, if somebody has to squint, if somebody has to, like, you know, on their, on their mobile screen, they're 
expanding it to try to see the detail. I think that's where you want to really um, think about the processing speed. So you want to use photography that can register instantaneously as much as possible. You know, uh, like can someone who is I don't know, you know, 10 feet away from the desktop screen, can they, can they immediately understand what is the photo that they're looking at? If they're on a mobile screen, is this something that is going to read well um, when they've only got three or four inches of real estate between their fingers? You know, so I think that's what's most important is how quickly you can process the visual information you're trying to convey in the photo. Now, if it's meant to be something that's just beautiful, like a waterfall or a sunset, you know, then I think you're fine. But when you're trying to uh, express something about, um, you know, whether it's an apparel item or a piece of electronics or something, I think you want to ask yourself, you know, how, how long does someone have to stare at this before they understand the point of the photo? That's awesome. So uh, just to summarize on the poll, uh, we had a little over half of people thought the paradox of choice is the most interesting so far, followed by just-in-time information, and then obviously we just touched on an important point for processing fluency. Um, but want to make sure that we give everyone all the, the great content here, and we're going to move on to number four. Yes, great. Okay, so micro commitments. I'm going to speed up a little bit here, and luckily I have already alluded to micro commitments. I'm just going to go a tiny bit faster. Um, so seemingly small steps can greatly increase the odds of a big commitment. Uh, and the important thing to remember this is that it, it's really disproportionate, surprisingly disproportionate. Um, you can see for yourself what some of the synonyms are. Um, and I'll tell you a story about um, you know a startup that is doing a great job with micro commitments. Um, and uh, I think it's called uh, uh, Benchmade. And so basically, this is a custom. This is a custom couch company that's trying to sell you a two or three thousand dollar couch that you've never sat on. And the way that they do that is with micro commitments, right? So they're not trying to sell you a three thousand dollar couch, obviously, on your first visit to the site. What they're trying to do on the first visit is to get you to come back for a second visit, and then they're trying to get you to order a fabric swatch, and then um, they put in this other uh, interim step, which I thought was really just genius in terms of talk about slippery slope, right? So after the fabric slot, then they want to send you a life-size paper template of your couch, like a six-foot roll of paper. So it costs them what it would cost to send like a poster roll through the mail. And they want you to roll out that six-foot or seven-foot paper template in your room and then come and buy that $3,000 couch from their site. Really brilliant use of micro-commitments and slippery slope concepts. The, um, the, 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 you know, sort of seminal work in this area was uh, the SOAP study where, um, you know, uh, in one group of people, uh, they called the lady of the house, this was like, you know, many decades ago, and they said, you know, would you mind, I'm calling from the California Consumer Product, you know, Services Agency, would you mind answering a few questions on the phone? And the people who got that initial call and said yes to that initial small request, had 141% greater likelihood of saying yes to the next large request. So the large request is, can we send a team to your house to inventory all, all your cleaning products, which is a much larger request, because they're asking for hours of time there. But by saying yes to the initial small thing, you can really boost likelihood of the, of the, of the big act. So you can see this by offering micro commitments in terms of like value added content. So before you buy from us, download something from us. Before you buy from us, watch this video and we'll give you some value. Or even click to add to cart in order to see the price of something. Um, that can also be a micro commitment. And then here's one of my favorite micro commitments. So um, this is a website called Paula's Choice. Uh, I use them um, for some of my skincare needs. Um, but what I really love about them is that they will sell me an 80 cent sample of a product that could retail for 20 to $80, right? And then they will let me buy that for 80 cents in a sample size. I think this is really brilliant and this has converted me many, many times. And I think you see this as, a, as an example um, being done uh, by a lot of different retailers. Here's a very large retailer. I believe this is uh, Sephora is this example. Um, because then once momentum's going, you want to keep it rolling, right? So um, once the purchase is done, well, maybe now the purchase becomes the micro-commitment. What could be a larger commitment? Oh, become a member. Become a lifetime member. Join the club, et cetera. Or start a subscription, right? Now, now let us send it to you every month. So, yeah, in a nutshell, you know, once that little 
commitment is done, once you get that foot in the door, um, people start to think of themselves as your customer, and then you can um, really ramp up the degree of ask. All right. Okay. That's, that's oh, there you go. There oh, it is. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to mention that we are getting a ton of really great questions, but in order to make sure we get through the core information, we'll save some of these to the end. Okay. Moving on. Um, so the next principle is simultaneous choice presentation. Um, so this one is a really subtle one um, that a lot of people, um, you know, don't don't realize, which is that people are happier with their decisions, which means they'll be more satisfied with their purchase when they can evaluate all of their options simultaneously, right? And this actually taps into um, the maximizing versus satisfying literature. If you guys have heard about that. So sometimes there are people who are looking for the absolute best and they don't care, you know, how many articles they have to read to figure it out. Uh, but a lot of times your shoppers are just looking for something that's good enough. So how can you make them really happy with a good enough purchase? Well, the way that you can do it is showing them their options at the same time. Chocolate study was done with chocolate truffles. And so um, in one case, they were given one at a time and then asked to pick one. And in the other case, they were given all five at the same time, and those people were 90% more satisfied, which is a very statistically significant difference with their choice. So how does this apply to e-commerce? So once again, you do see some of echoes of what we were talking about before in terms of drilling down by segment. But see, what this does is it's subtly different and yet very powerful, which is that in this example, they're letting you see the high-level segments at a glance. Right? At the end of the day, Land's End just has these three silhouettes. And I can see all three of my choices at a high level, and then I can start drilling down. So that's going to make me more satisfied with whatever I buy at the end. Uh, this is another way. Within a product category, um, having these sort of comparison tools where I can put the high end and the entry level right next to each other really increases satisfaction and it's powerful for conversion. And then finally, you know, what you don't want to do is make it feel like an endless sequence, right? Because as soon as you're, you're showing a huge number of options, they can't really be addressed simultaneously or evaluated that way. What we speculate um, is that this not only um, hurts final satisfaction, but it could possibly even create more return. And we know that that's really important for retailer margins. So that's, so that's simultaneous choice presentation in a nutshell. Um, awesome. The next principle is called the compromise effect. Um, so the compromise effect is about how people will tend to gravitate to the happy media. And this is something we see in our daily lives, but, you know, academics call it by really wacky names. <laughs> like asymmetric dominance effect and decision field theory. Um, but I think, um, you know, this is something that people can really relate to. And, and, and maybe this is something you can even implement today, right, is that if you are seeing a lot of your shoppers um, veer towards, like in the first square here on the left, you're going to see that 79% of people buy the less expensive paper shredder. And so if you want to increase tickets, put up a more expensive product that you're actually not even expecting to sell that much of. Because then what you're doing is you're creating a different perception of what is the middle. So this is, this is um, something that you, know, you may have seen before, um, but this is the moment for you to really go and try it out on your site if it's appropriate. Right? Think about putting up that $100 shredder as an option, not because you're going to sell a bunch of it, but because it's going to drive to the, a new middle option and increase your ticket. Um, you can also think of this at a higher level of how you position yourself between competitors. Um, and, you know, I could talk about that for days. Um, but then here's the other way that you can do it, is that if you have pricing plans, right, if you have subscription plans, if you have, you know, if you already are showing um, at-a-glance options, you can then double down on that by using an explicit trigger, by like labeling something as best value, most popular, you know, critic's choice, editor's favorite, et cetera. Think about using these explicit triggers because people are looking for them and the reason they're looking for them is because they actually align with our uh, core cognitions and, and uh, sort of those caveman preferences. 
Um, and one of the things that's really magical about creating a, any kind of a short list for um, your shoppers is that given any three choices, each shopper can make their own middle, right? One woman might pick the middle price. One woman might pick the middle between sexy and comfortable. So, um, so yeah, good stuff. <laughs> but in a nutshell, uh, this this kind of happy medium um, can really work for you um, if you if you uh, do the work to apply it. So then we get to reactance theory, the seventh and final principle, and you can think of it as uh, basically reverse psychology, um, but also the need to affirm um, freedom of choice and free will for your shoppers. So the study um, from here was actually originally done in France, and it was people asking for change for the bus. These were sort of clean-cut college students asking for change for the bus at a mall. And if they simply added, but you are free to choose, right? But you are free, right? And that's, and that's how um, a lot of people in the industry call it, but you are free technique. They not only increased the rate of compliance, they increased the amount of average money that they were given. And that's how good it feels to the brain to be told that we have freedom of choice. So careful with single product recommendations where someone might say, hey, you don't know me. Like, don't tell me what to buy. Um, that's a hidden landmine when it comes to product recommendations. Uh, whereas providing a choice set here, now this is obviously not very visually pretty, but it's showing, you know, a half a dozen options that actually feels better to the brain. You're less likely to trigger resistance. Be careful with persona labels. What if I don't like the word eclectic? What if I think new traditional is, you know, silly oxymoron, right? Be careful with that. Maybe just ask uh, questions like leather or fabric instead. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, the return policy. Like that reassurance, you know, a lot of people weren't going to use it, but feeling that reassurance that I could always return this if I wasn't so lazy <laughs> is um, a great way to uh, get people over that final hurdle of doing business with you. Um, and you can also use reverse psychology simply to grab the Attention. You know, don't buy this jacket became a really sort of award-winning ad campaign because it really could stop you. Like, you know, you could be driving by this billboard that would really make you turn your head. Wait, don't buy this jacket? Why is that? Who is that? So that really brings us to the end of the seven principles and to our second poll. Rob? Yeah, so I think we're actually going to skip the poll. There's been a ton of great questions coming in. We want to give everyone a quick second to uh, ask those. Anything that's still left uh, burning in their brains and We'll start reading off some of the ones that um, that came in. I think one of the first okay, ones. Okay, well, let me just. Yep, oh, go ahead. you know, um, let me. I would. Should should we do Q and A or should I show the shopping quizzes really quick here? Uh, it's up to you. Okay, let me just show because I can show this in about thirty seconds. So let me just do this, and then we we'll, can do questions for the rest of our time. So now that you've seen all seven ways. I wanted to show you what it looks like when you combine it all and put all seven ways into action. So this is what shopping quizzes look like. On the left, you see one of our partners, one of our customers, GolfHQ.com. And on the right, you see what their site, what their category page for men's golf shoes, which is one of their top sellers, what it looks like with a shopping quiz. And so instead of that long scrolling page that goes on and on for hundreds of discounted men's golf shoes, instead you see a this or that visual question, like your spike list. And then when you zoom in on it and you actually click one, then it shows you another option like athletic or classic. And then another simple question of colorful or neutral. And basically within five seconds, you get this sort of instant gratification of here's your personal top three. So this is at a glance now, right? This is simultaneous choice presentation. And there's no paradox of choice because three is a manageable choice set. And we don't show one because we're not going to trigger that reactance of like, don't tell me what to buy. And what we've seen is that this can increase conversions by over 20% when we tested this with a random A-B test. So that's what it looks like when you combine all of the principles together. Um, awesome. And uh, okay, yeah, so okay, let's do questions. So I think one that leads right in there, uh, assuming that they can't get to all seven, which one or maybe two do you think would have the highest impact? Um, I think micro-commitments is really important for e-commerce. Um, and and, and you, you hear all the agencies out there touting how incredibly critical retargeting is, right? And the reason that they're saying that is because odds of a purchase on first visit are incredibly low, and retargeting is very important. 
And that's the same reason why I think micro commitments is very important. Because if you can just get them to watch a video or give you their email address or interact with your selection um, or download a guide, um, I think that, that that is critically important and for the same reason that you see retargeting being sold as the number one ROI in ad spend. Gotcha. Now that actually brings up a very interesting point. Another question was video versus pictures. Uh, is there an impact to search results or conversion results and which one would you recommend? Um, well, did you say video versus pictures? Correct. So like if I could so put I in a, a video of a shoe versus a photo of a shoe. So I, honestly, the ideal answer is both, right? So um, some people, um, you know, are not going to load video as quickly. Some people, for some people, video is going to feel like too much of a commitment. <laughs> um, but then for other people that are further down the funnel and closer to purchasing, they go, yeah, show me that thing where the shoe rotates <laughs> in 360 degrees. Like, I really want to see that because I'm really close to purchasing, right? But for somebody else, that's actually, believe it or not, too much of a commitment. And so what they want to do is just sort of click through a few different angle photos. So the, the truly ideal answer to that is use both, if at all possible. Right on. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, and that kind of feeds into another question. When you're talking to, say, a search engine optimization uh, consultant or expert, and they're trying to get you to add more context, more text, more keywords to your descriptions, uh, what's the right balance and how do you respond to that to try to get down to a minimal text uh, type interface? So, um, you know, as a former SEO myself, I can certainly understand, um, you know, the, the desire for more text on the page for the juice that it provides. Um, one of the things that I see as an effective way to do that is, um, have you noticed like um, that, that sort of product page design where the information is on different tabs? So like there's like an initial tab that gives like a high level description of the product and there might be like a second tab for like fit and fabric and then like another tab that's like, you know, specifications and measurements and size chart. I think allowing once again that self-directed drill down to the more, more, more instead of showing it all on one page in one view where like your eyes see, you know, like five paragraphs, hide it behind different tabs if you can. Right, that's a great, great idea. So we're coming up to the end here, and I just wanted to thank everyone for their participation. We've had some awesome questions. We didn't necessarily get to all of them, but uh, some of them may be answered, I think, in the bonus material that we'll be sending out. And for anybody whose questions did not get answered, we'll send a follow-up directly to you. So thank you great. all. And thank you, Jenny. Uh, this is really, really great information, and we greatly appreciate having your time here. Great, and I hope to connect with everybody either on Twitter or, on Twitter or through shoppingquizzes.com. Thanks, everybody. Right on. Thank you.